Um, first, I'd like to say welcome. Uh, I'm Jessica Hollander. I'm the Associate Director of Experiential Education here on campus in our Leadership, Innovation, and Liberal Arts Center, Myla. I'm also an alum. The series of presentations focuses on partnering with students and blended learning initiatives in the form of hands on experience and competency based approaches through collaborative methods. Megan M. Grady and Amanda Starkle present on the Information Commons program and its student employee partnerships while discussing how staffing and financial constraints led to innovate, innovation in the form of LMS based online modules. All right, so um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Megan Grady Rutledge. I'm representing Butler University today as an academic technology specialist, and I'm here with my partner, and I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, I'm Amanda Starkle. I'm the Information Commons and E-Learning Librarian at Butler, and I've been um, at that institution for about four years now, and my name's been Yes, and so um, we co-supervise um, a student employee partnership called the Information Commons Program, which Amanda is going to tell you more about. So um, Information Commons has been around since 2009, and as Megan said, it is a student employee partnership. Um, it has always been a partnership between the libraries and the Center for Academic Technology, or as we affectionately call them, CAT. Um, we use a lot of uh, short names around here, so if you get lost, let me know. Um, but uh, Butler University is in Indianapolis, Indiana, where a small um, liberal arts college of about 4,000 students. So since 2009, this program has been in place, and it has been committed on experiential learning opportunities for the students that we employ. Um, one thing that I wanted to make sure that we talked about um, uh, so CAT is the Center for Academic Technology, and we um, often abbreviate and call Information Commons IC, and the students that work for us ICers. So um, we have two service locations. Um, both now are within the same building on campus, so within the main campus library. Um, over the years, it's evolved, but we currently have about 30 students that work for us, and all the students work in each of the locations, so they get to experience what it's like to be at the main service point at the main campus library, and then also at the service point in CAT, which um, at the service point in the library, they are our circulation point, and they check out equipment to students and check out books and answer reference and research questions. And then in the Center for Academic Technology point, they're working more with faculty and staff and helping with technology-based questions and also circulating technology equipment up there for that population. So a little bit about our ICers, some really important details. Um, almost all of our students are undergraduates. Um, they don't, we don't require any discipline, so we have some students who are coughs and um, pharmacy, um, sorry, our School of Health Sciences is called coughs. Um, we have business students, we have some dance majors occasionally when they can work it into their very busy schedules. Um, they work an average of eight hours a week. Um, we have a layer of peer leaders in the program. We ask that they work 10, just a little bit more uh, commitment out of them. Starting pay is $8 an hour. And we hold them to professional expectations for attire and behavior. So we tell every student when we interview them and from day one, that um, you know, for attire, it sets them apart within the library, so it's clear that they're working, so they're not there in their jeans. They're um, going to look a little bit more professional on shift. Um, and when it comes to behavior, um, they're not working on homework. Um, we tell them that you're coming to be engaged, you're coming to be um, active when you're on shift, you shouldn't be on your phones or on social media. Um, so in return for that, we promise to meet some student learning objectives for the program and support them for future endeavors. So we require this um, amount of buy-in to the program so that they understand that, you know, maybe it's not the best pay, but you really are going to get something that can be a professional experience that you're going to learn from and you're going to keep talking about as you move on to these next steps in your life. So with that, okay. All right, so I'm going to, to discuss briefly the learning goals of the program. And I just want to point out that the learning goals of this program are revisited consistently because we need to make sure that they align with the ever-expanding um, you know, needs of our campus, but also the ever-evolving definition of 21st century skills, which um, are is basically um, often broadly defined as the particular skills, knowledge, and abilities that students need to be successful in the information age. 
And owing to the fact we have two service points, one is library that deals with a lot of research, and the other um, technology, which is more uh, kind of technology literacy, digital literacy type tools, um, we found that 21st century skills really represented what we wanted our students to learn. Um, and through that, we came up with these particular learning objectives, and we're very transparent with students at the outset about what these are and what they'll get from the program. And um, through these um, objectives, we then developed training that forced students to uh, engage with, evaluate, and um, use information and technology. So those really inform how our training was developed. So those are the learning objectives related to 21st century skills. Um, but Amanda and I are um, both teachers by training and temperament. So another thing that we thought was important is that our students reflected on what they were learning in the program and tied it back to what they were here at Butler to do, which was to get an education um, and to prepare for their futures. So we really asked them to connect those personal academic and career goals to their work experiences to lay the foundation for lifelong learning. And a lot of times this happens in a reflection portfolio, um, which used to be housed in WordPress uh, before I, uh, we actually changed that recently. WordPress was a tool that was a little too big for the assignment in this case. So we went to Google Sites, where we will ask for education campus. So um, we thought it would be a good thing for students to get exposure to Google Sites. They do reflection portfolios there, and we have specific prompts that we ask them to work through as they go through training. Um, also, we ask them to help us assess our efforts on an, um, you know, a programmatic scale to help us look at data and really see um, what type of consultations they're doing and what um, growth is represented there as well. Um, and then they have consultation and they reflect on how they cultivate learning and skill development in others and they have us produce materials for that as well. So that is the reflection piece for our learning goals. And so our training, um, and, and it really kind of echoes what you guys said, when you have students that are of various schedules, we have 30 of them, and um, you really got to try to find a way to get them to know the same things, um, you, you have to offload that training into an asynchronous environment so that they can do it at their own pace. Um, our training, just like our learning objectives, uh, is constantly evolving. It's something we really work hard to do. Um, it is housed in Moodle, so I do have it pulled up right here. So during the school year, it stays consistent, and over the summers and breaks, Amanda and I, along with the ICRs who are employed at the time, we do have students working the summer as well, help us to revamp the trainings and to really assess, you know, was this a good training? Does this need work? Uh, so as we look at this training, and, and she's going to talk about it as well, so I won't go too deeply into it, um, but it's in Moodle, which is our LMS at Butler. And uh, if you notice, there are several sections. It takes our students um, roughly a semester to get through the training. Um, and when they're working at the service points and they're not helping you know, with consultations and different things of that nature, they're working through this training. Um, each, so the training, um, each element of it is... Um, kind of prefaced by a competency checklist. So we want to be transparent going into the module. These are the skills you'll need to have upon completion of this. Um, and on these checklists, which I think I'm going to go into that a little bit more, um, there are different ways to attest to mastery. So for skills that maybe are a little lower stakes, um, we allow students to self-attest to mastery. And those skills are usually building blocks for the higher level skills that we do assess, whether it's through um, a quiz or a face-to-face -face checkpoint or something of that nature. Um, so um, we do have assessment built in as they go through these as well. But if you look here, I mean, it's really robust. And corresponding to this, we have a Trello board um, that we use to track the training, and we use the checklist so that as students get through each part of the module, they check it off in Trello, and we can just go in Trello and look at their cards and see immediately they've done six out of eight trainings in this module. We don't even have to open the cards. So it's been a really, really nice thing in that regard. So obviously, this is a, a lot of training, and um, as our students from the first shifts are, are called into doing service, so this is something that they're doing as they have time when they're not you know, being asked questions from people. So the very first part of training 
is focused on the, the most important things that they need to be able to function at the service point, and then it definitely builds from there. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about um, really quickly are just the way that we verify that this training is worthwhile and that it is being effective because it's obviously a huge time commitment and we need to do that, I think, to ourselves and to the students so that they understand why we're, we're asking them to do this much work. And we do this in three ways. Um, first, the peer leader model that we talked about, I mentioned briefly. Um, so we have about um, anywhere between four to six peer students who are leading small teams of the rest of their peers through training. And um, so they're verifying as we go through and offering support to the rest of the teams about um, the training that they're going through. So that could be anything from you know, giving feedback about an activity that someone has completed within Moodle or um, you know, talking to them within a forum or assessing their service point statistics to make sure that their service isn't operating in a vacuum, that their service is in line with where they are in the training and that they're meeting um, proper service expectations. So peer leaders are one way that we verify that the training is being met and accomplished as we want. Um, as Megan said, we have certain face-to-face -face checkpoints that are built in within training at certain statistic or strategic points. We actually um, ask the students to meet one-on-one -on -one with staff members. So when students get through their research training, I, as their librarian, will meet with them and can perform a reference interaction to make sure that their work is up to my standards. Megan meets with them to speak uh, about Moodle and make sure that we're just um, not having anything fall through the cracks there. And we've also found that those are really valuable times for the students to connect with staff. So there are some face-to-face -face checkpoints, and then Megan mentioned the reflection portfolios. Um, which we have them build in the first sections of training, and then by checking what their reflections have been, um, are serve as another way for us to make sure that the training is being effective. And there are strategic reflection prompts throughout training um, that we can check into. So, so I know on our Moodle course it looks like there was a lot, and that's actually because we've used that course kind of as an archiving system. There are really only four sections to our training. Um, these big broad sections. So day-to-day -day skills, as I mentioned, the most important things they need to be able to function um, in our environments. Um, that includes things like customer service and, and reference work. Um, Butler-supported technology systems. So that's um, Moodle, Excel, Google Drive, Panapto for our campus recording software. Um, so, so basic tools like that. And what we've tried to do is take the technology tool and match it with a library concept. So when they're learning about PowerPoint, they're learning, um, also they're creating a PowerPoint about our archives or something so that it's not operating in a vacuum anymore. Um, information ecosystem, consuming and creating, that's really digital and visual, uh, digital and visual literacy, information literacy, um, critically reading photographs, things like that, of that nature. Um, a little bit about open access and open resources, creative commons, those sorts of things come into play at that point. Um, infographics. Um, that section, we, I think it's, it's our favorite section, so we get really excited when they get to that point. And then next steps, we give students the freedom to tell us what they want to explore, um, what they want to sandbox, or um, if there's equipment that they want to, to dig into, or professional development, since we, we told them that's a ton of the program, we allow them to develop their online presence, their digital identity, their LinkedIn, et cetera. So um, we just wanted to give you an example of what some of these sections look like. So again, this is a section of training called Outlook. It starts with a checklist, which just lists out prior knowledge and areas um, that could be of areas improvement if they don't already know these things. So this one in particular is very focused on the features of Outlook. Um, and then the second thing in the section of training is a resources page that lists out all sorts of videos, documentation, et cetera, when it comes to Outlook. If that's something a student hasn't used before, they can go through the resource page at their leisure and they can check what they need to to build their skills. Um, and then we have them test their knowledge via an activity. Um, so we actually have realistic patron emails that we give them and we ask them to respond as if this were a real patron and use certain Outlook features to show us that you know how to respond with an Outlook email. And then the student supervisor peer leader will be the one who verifies that for us. So that uh, offsets some of the work for us. 
So that is one example of training, and here is another. So um, one of the things that I found really interesting uh, when we were going through the training process, it was important to us that we had like a two for one. So that students, when they were doing the Outlook activity, they were also responding to a library question because we want them to see the connections between the two service points. We don't want them to be siloed. Um, so that was really important. Um, one of, I think, as Amanda mentioned, our favorite activities was the training section on information and visual literacy. I just want to briefly pull up this checklist so you can get an idea of what that would look like for students. Um, I won't spend too much time on this, but if you look here, there are the different ways that students can um, be assessed here. So for instance, this first one right here, these are the competencies related to information and visual literacy. Um, this one has to be verified by their peer manager. So they have to get the initials of the peer manager for this particular competency that might be advanced through something they've done in Moodle or a project of that nature. Then here we have um, something that an assistant can verify, yes, because I, it's an infographic that we created that goes over looking at photographs and re reading them critically. So they can just say, yes, basically I read that, I understand this concept. And then um, these have activities attached to them. So the peer leader makes sure they're done and, and checks off. And then the bottom here, again, the assistant can self-attest to having mastery of those specific skills. We just identify which ones we want to have assessed. And we, and we do that based on our service point statistics and which particular skills are more important for their function on the job. Those are the ones we, we like to have a peer assess or that we like to assess. Um, so if I go back now, just to kind of go over this particular activity, um, with this, we had a, a resources page to fill in any knowledge gaps while they were going through those things. Um, and we had various activities. One was a critically reading photos activity. Um, another is an infographic introduction and sharing. So in the course on the research, resources page, we created a training using Adobe Spark page uh, where we introduce students to what infographics are, what the principles are for their creation. And then that links to a Pinterest board that we've used as a repository to either pin exemplary infographics or maybe not so exemplary ones. Um, and then uh, we ask students to, and I'll show that discussion in just a second, but to showcase the infographic they like best and say why. And we hope that they tether it to the principles of design, but they don't always do that. We'll talk about that. Um, the last one that we had them do for this particular section was a reflection prompt to differentiate between, uh, or actually not just differentiate, but find commonalities to um, and reflect on information and visual literacy. Uh, so we had them do that. And then there's a verification a tied to it as uh, tied to it as you saw with the checklist. So this is a student example. So in Moodle we have discussion forums, and the activity for the infographic was share a link. We wanted to, this to be a really informal activity. Um, share a link of an infographic you like and explain why. Andrew, one of our students, he's quite the character. His response is, is a little bit funny. Um, so he's just explaining why he liked that. He's saying it had a wide range of colors, which they're really not supposed to have that wide of a range of colors, so we'll talk to him about that later. But um, this is just an example of how they might respond. And then this is his peer who responded and said, you know, I, I like the point that you made. This is the issue that I saw with the infographic. So what we learn from these forums is when we need to intervene and give students more tools, particularly the leaders, to help their, the, the, um, what we call assistance. So from this, uh, Amanda has created an infographic rubric that the managers can use moving forward to really kind of give more constructive guidance. Um, and so, yeah, so that's why this training is valuable in that regard, too, to look at these things. And then our students um, have, the, the response has been overwhelmingly positive to the new checklist model we rolled it out last year. They really liked um, the checklist because it helped them bring things into perspective and it helped them to really figure out, you know, not only to reflect, this is what I did learn, um, but, but to move forward with, with clear uh, goals in mind. There's some other ways that we wanted to, um, to assess 
our success with this. Um, so here are two more um, pieces of data that we've got that support our claim that this checklist model has been successful. Um, first of all, the checklist model creates clear benchmarks so that students are better able to track their progress and stay on top of their trainings. As we said, it's almost an entire semester long. Um, a lot of the feedback we've been getting before was that there's just too much to know and it was overwhelming students. But now, with the way that the checklist model works, um, students are saying that most of the time, all the time, or some of the time, um, they're really feeling like they're on top of their trainings. They know where they stand. They know what they're working towards. And being able to check off a checklist gives them a sense of pride. Um, also, um, uh, students report a better overall IC experience with us. Um, this five, um, five or four out of a scale of, of one to five, um, overwhelmingly, you know, 50-50 for good or an awesome experience with IC now that we have the checklist model in place. Um, it also makes it easier for us to have them doing things once they do finally finish their training. And a lot of our students stick with the program for two years, sometimes even longer. So these are the sorts of things that we've been able to ask our students to do um, without having to go and retrain a lot because the training has already instilled these skills in them. So we've had them assist with classroom sessions on iMovie um, with the business librarian. Um, we can have them build lib guides, um, pilot new technology for the campus. They make a lot of infographics for us for library outreach and for events. Um, we've had students compete in you know, library business case competitions and create their own training moving forward so that they can help us keep those things up to date and moving in the directions we want them to. So that's the ultimate benefit of training is what we're able to have them do. It, it essentially just increases the manpower of the library and the Center for Academic Technology. Um, the last thing we wanted to share, um, we are working to put all of our training into a Google shared file. Um, so this link will be at the end of our presentation and almost all of our training is up there. We're still working to do a couple more sections and we have some revisions planned for the summer. But um, we're trying to put it in format so it's not Moodle specific, so you're able to use whatever you would like out of there. Um, we have lots of lots of great activities that would work in all sorts of different um, you know environments that we'd love for you to try out and give us feedback. So, thank you. Thank you. I was wondering if you could. Um, so it sounds like you have some you have uh, student leaders you mentioned, but I imagine you also have many students who just continue on in the lower tier position. I'm wondering what the ongoing training looks like. It sounds like this is the initial training, right? Right. Um, actually, most of what they'll spend their time with end up being these sorts of things. I see. What we yeah. call this is like the project phase, okay. and that's something that is housed on Trello. So they sort of move their way from spending most of their time in Moodle to spending more time in Trello and helping with these sorts of things that come up during their shifts in, in long-term projects that we can make them in charge of. And, and we also have an element where if they have something they're interested in learning, they can request professional development or tinker time to learn that tool. Um, and we source a lot of, um, to source that we use, uh, we have atomic learning. I don't know if you guys know anything similar. I like Linda better, but we have atomic learning and that's helpful <laughs> for, for getting them that. And sometimes they want to learn stuff that we might not know a lot about. So um, you mentioned that you know the curriculum or the, the skills that you're including need to continually evolve as our concept of information literacy evolves. Mm -hmm. Do you have a dialogue with your faculty at Butler of the skills and literacy that they have an expectation for? knowing not only that your own staff is trained, but that students would have the ability to work with this tool set or these concepts? That's a really great question. Um, we've been revamping with student learning outcomes as a university. So I've had some conversations like that with and conversations about the larger curriculum as a whole. Um, so our, our original um, learning outcomes were modeled off of the original um, learning outcomes, and we used to have 12 of them, which is way too many for the institution, so they're trying to bring them down to a better number. Um, so I think most of our conversations have been tied into, okay, here's the student learning outcomes for the university as a whole, and then within certain departments, like I, as a librarian, work with FYS quite a bit, and where does FYS expect information literacy to be coming in, and, and aligning those at least with the primary group we serve are those um, first-year students, so... Mm -hmm. So making it align with that. 
And just to piggyback on that, I think another good way to get a pulse on uh, the campus needs, the faculty's needs, are our stats. So mm -hmm. our, our students, when they do consultations, have to use uh, LibStat. Well, it's actually reference analytics um, through Springshare. And they have to you know, document their interactions. And then we use that at the end of the year to say, we're getting a lot of questions um, on infographics, or we're getting a lot of questions on um, a specific way of researching, or something like that. And then we can respond to that through our training. Thank you. Thank you.